Discovery Show. We are kicking off. So I wanted to start with that because today is going to be the most incredible day. We are at the Founder Made Discovery Show. For those of you who know the Founder Made, the Discovery Show is what we have always done live. We are doing it virtually. It is June 2021. This has already been a bright and beautiful year already. And for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, there's a ton of really exciting stuff coming for you. For those of you who are veterans with us, uh, thank you and welcome back. The reason why I started with Sierra, if you are early fans, you are gonna be hearing from her at 3.30 this afternoon. So get ready and please stay tuned. Uh, to kick off, I wanna run through a few things. So first of all, we have a Zoom chat box here. Those of you who've been on Zoom all year long, probably most of you, you know the drill, but we really wanna hear from you. Today is all about networking. It's all about making connections. It's all about learning. It's about inspiration and motivation. So please jump in there. We want to know who you are. We wanna know what you're building, what inspires you, questions that you have. You'll have the opportunity to get these things answered throughout the day. So please just go ahead. Great, Deborah, glad to be here. Deborah, it's great to hear from you. Uh, so more of you, please, please, please. It definitely keeps us energized and it's the best way to possibly engage. Uh, moving forward, we're going to have showcases. We're going to have an incredible pitch competition at the end of the day. So stay engaged, stay online. The, we have a discovery box actually also who went that went out to our top retailers, to our top investors, media, influencers. If you have that discovery box with you, please grab it. There is a QR code on a, a card that's inside. That QR code corresponds with our marketplace. You can check out these brands and engage further there. Also, these products are going to be, uh, you know, the products of the brands you're going to be hearing from on our showcases. So play around with them, start using them. And again, you'll be able to ask those questions and hear more about the missions and the why for how those products came to be and how they ended up in your hands. And with that, I would love to introduce New York Times bestseller, Nicole Lappin, who will be moderating our upcoming session. Nicole, are you here? Hi. Hello. All right. The star has arrived. I will let you take it from here. Well, thank you, Michelle, and thank you to the entire Founder Made community. I can't wait to see everyone in real life, uh, but we are going to kick off today with a fantastic keynote of Jamie Kern Lima. You may recognize her from It Cosmetics. She's definitely an It girl. She sold the company to L'Oreal for, was it 2.1? Billion? I got that right. Plus 1.2 billion. Yeah. Oh, 1.2. I just flipped it around. The next company is going to be 2.1. Uh, well, it's so great to see you this morning uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, you were the first CEO of a L'Oreal company, but you actually started in local news like I did. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, by the way. I'm super honored. I always love hanging out with founders also. And just, um, I think when we're all in this together, we all rise higher. And so it's an honor to be here and just to share time with, with you, Nicole, with everyone today. So thank you again. Well, it's great to see you. I feel like you're a sister from another mister, but this is the first time that we're connecting uh, virtually. I dove into your book and as an author, I know when interviewers actually read it and they don't. So <laughs> I wanted to make sure that I was all over it. Um, you started with a quote from Cinderella that says the greatest risk any of us will take is to be seen as who you truly are. Um, so we've seen so many of the headlines. You've been on Success Magazine cover. You've had this amazing tour with Believe It on the New York Times bestseller list for eight weeks. But who are you truly? Oh, love. <laughs> I'm truly love. Um, and, you know, unstoppable, really a girl who a lot of people see the headlines and they think like, oh, you went from Denny's waitress to, you know, local news, as you mentioned, billion dollar entrepreneur. Uh, but really, I'm a girl who figured out how to go from from not believing in myself to, to believing in myself. And, um, you know, uh, not knowing even how to hear my own intuition to, to learning how to hear my gut and make the decision to trust it. Um, someone who went from doubting she's enough to knowing she's enough. It's been a journey. Uh, it's been a journey to, to get to this point. And, um, you know, I think a big reason why I'm, I also love just 
having conversations like this is I think that, you know, even founders and especially nowadays with social media and you have to kind of like look like you have it all together online. But at the end of the day, I think we all kind of struggle with some of the same self-doubt and some of the same, you know, especially nowadays comparison syndrome, all these things, temptation to change who we authentically are. And, you know, in, in my journey, I, I've seen tens of thousands of, of entrepreneurs and, and uh, especially women with big dreams. And I think that for most of them, um, self-doubt ends up killing more dreams um, than, than anything else. And so for me, it's really been a journey of, of learning how to go from underestimated to, to unstoppable and how to not talk myself out of my own truth. And so that's why I'm super honored to, to share whatever I can with anyone else in their own journey today. Because uh, being a founder, having big dreams, actually being one of the people going after them, uh, uh, you're one of the rare ones. And so we got to stick together. <laughs> we do. And you know, as we were trying to dig into how all of the founders are really made, it's so nice to hear you be so vulnerable and, uh, you know, talk about some of the struggles that you've had with anxiety, with self-doubt. We've all been there. The biggest enemy is between our ears, imposter syndrome. I still struggle with that. I don't think it ever goes away. You talk about uh, body doubt and God doubt. Mm -hmm. I have never heard God doubt though. What is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think, um, my, my whole journey really is figuring all of that out. And I think, you know, for me and a lot of people, you know, I, when I built it cosmetics, right, we, we started in our living room and, uh, and my whole journey was just filled with no's. Sometimes you'll see a founder launch an idea or a product or whatever, and it will get hot right away. And, uh, and that wasn't my experience. Um, my journey was, was, uh, was, and, and by the way, to answer your question, figuring out how to overcome not just self-doubt and body doubt, but God doubt was critical um, in, in my journey of, of, of starting with literally no money in my living room, building a billion dollar company um, because it was really a journey of so much rejection and, and hearing so many no's along the way and, and learning how to, well, first of all, I prayed like crazy, but I also doubted God exists a lot in my life. And I really learned in my journey how to turn down the noise and the volume on self-doubt and other people's opinions. Um, for me, when I pray and I, I, I just get this gut feeling, like I, I think I've never heard God talk, <laughs> but, but for me, um, in my own personal faith, um, I, I believe, you know, God talks to me through my intuition. I think when I get a really strong gut feeling, I've learned to trust it. And I, and for me, it's really been a big journey of keeping my faith bigger than my fear. Um, and, you know, so, you know, I go there, like in, in my new book, Believe It, I go there. When, when, when I built a company of over a thousand employees, you have to be so professional and respectful. And, um, and I intentionally hired teams of every different faith, of no faith, of, you know, I, I believe that not just our teams, but our boardrooms should look like our customers do. And our customers at, at Cosmetics are every person, every person, <laughs> every age and shape and skin tone and gender identity and, and, and faith and, and background. And so I, you know, I really intentionally hired a team that way. And so my personal faith wasn't something I talked to openly about very much in the whole journey. And so, but I, I think for me, it's like the espresso inside the latte. It's like, if you don't have it, it's not the same uh, in my journey. So yeah, I talk about that really openly a lot, Nicole. And I think that I really think it's important we share like the real stories behind the stories, if we're ever going to really grow together. And, you know, I was raised uh, going to church every Sunday, but I didn't connect with faith. I would just sit through church and scan the pews looking for cute boys, like counting down the minutes until the sermon was over. And, and so most of my life, while I was in a family that had faith, I, I always, I would pray, but the truth is I would kind of like doubt that God was real. And, and one of the, the stories I talk about in the book um, uh, is, is the journey of God doubt. And, and there was a moment in my life where, um, where uh, I was having a really tough time. It was actually in news. I was in news at the time. And, um, and it was the first time in my life I was dealing with anxiety and all these things. And 
Anyways, I am um, a therapist said to me when I was saying to her, you know, I don't, I don't even know if God's real. I'm doubting he exists. I found out I was adopted. So I was, didn't, I was like, I don't know where I come from. And anyways, long story short, she said to me, uh, well, what makes you think God can't handle your doubt? And I'm like, what do you mean? And she goes, tell him you doubt him and ask him to prove you wrong. Um, I was like, okay. So this started like a decade long journey of every time I'd pray about, I'd be praying for a friend's health or something. And at the end I would say, by the way, God, like literally in the middle of my prayer, like silently, but I'd be like, I'm doubting you exist. So if you could please prove me wrong, beyond the shadow of a doubt, I'd be so grateful. Thank you. Amen. Um, and I share in the book, just some of the crazy, crazy, crazy stories of what happened. And some of them, even with investors, potential investors, with, with retailers who had said no to our product for so many years, like calling me out of the blue saying, uh, I don't know why, but like, uh, I was praying last night and I got this feeling that you're supposed to be in our store and it'd be like the weirdest conversation. So anyways, I share a lot of that stuff in the book that I've never shared before, <laughs> because I think these real, these are real conversations. A lot of times, you know, you look on social media, you see founders, entrepreneurs, you can read business tips all day long. Uh, but at the end of the day, as you mentioned in the beginning of this, I really believe for every one of us, every founder listening right now, every person who's going to be part of this or watch the replay, us living up to our potential, us stepping into our calling, us becoming the person we're born to be. Um, it's not business tips you can find anywhere. It's about figuring out the game in our own head of overcoming that self-doubt and all the other forms of doubt in our life um, in order to, to truly become the person we're born to be. It's about telling that mean girl or that mean guy inside your head to take several seats. Uh, you call it an inner critic. Do you think uh, she ever really goes away? Mm, no, I, th I think that inner critic um, can get so loud. And I think that so often, and especially as women, right? You look at a lot of the research out there that shows that we'll often make decisions by consensus, right? Like you'll see, you know, even it's from the time we're little kids, you know, you'll ask an opinion and, and, uh, and we do this still as, as adults, uh, ask an opinion and typically women will go, oh, you know, and, and they'll, they'll take a survey, <laughs> friends or family or, and, and then we have our own inner critic. And what I think happens to a lot of us is we start to confuse that inner critic or that inner self-doubt or other people's opinions uh, with our own truth, with our own knowing that we all have. We all, I believe we all have a knowing and I believe our gut is always more strong, you know, stronger than anyone else's advice. Um, but I think what happens so often is that inner critic gets so loud and, and, and we don't learn how to literally like what, like when I hear my own inner critic and I don't think it ever goes away. Um, I, I imagine myself turning down the volume and replacing thoughts with something that I know is true or that I just want to decide is true anyway. <laughs> and, um, and that's more, you know, more empowering. And I think, you know, you know, I started at cosmetics in, in our living room, um, close to no money. And, and I poured every penny I had into the business. And I thought, okay, if we can create just a great product that really works, it's just going to sell. And, uh, and then as so many founders have also shared this experience, I was like, oh, it's not that easy. You can have an amazing product. And, you know, I really did a lot of work on, um, and I talk about this and believe it a lot about not just figuring out the why for my brand, but peeling back the layers on it, going really, really deep to the why beneath the why that helps, you know, cause that's what really gives you the strength to keep going when you get knocked down. And I had done all those things, but what I wasn't ready for was, or I guess I should, should say, wasn't ready that was going to happen was just how much rejection would happen along the way. And when people tell us no, or, or a lot of other words, right? Like, like when people literally look us in the, in the eye and say like, you know, you're not the right fit for us or our customers, you're not right for our stores. Um, uh, it's not just a no right now. It's just, it, it's a real no, like, like you're, you're, you're not the right. And you just hear people or, or change who you are <laughs> to fit in or change your packaging or change this or change that. I think often when we get rejection, 
it can actually be helpful. Like there's parts of it. There's other people's advice, experts advice that could be really helpful in forms of rejection. But if we don't learn how to get still and hear, turn down our own inner critic, turn down the part of us that wants to replay the rejection over and over. If we don't learn how to get still and turn down the volume on that and really check in with our gut and go, okay, this retailer just told me to change my packaging to this or that this isn't right or whatever. Does that feel right to me? Does that advice feel right to me, right? I'm telling you, like, had I not learned to do that, I would have never built a billion dollar company because on the journey of building at Cosmetics, the first three years were hundreds and hundreds of no's. Like all, all of the retailers I love and, and, and shop at my whole life and like, I would save my tip money as a waitress at Denny's to like buy a MAC lipstick or Lancome eyeliner from these beautiful stores. I love these stores. And they were all telling me no, that, that I needed to change who I was or change our packaging or our packaging was too accessible. It needed to be way, high, you know, way more luxurious or uh, uh, I was using real uh, people as models. And, you know, I like I and at the time when I launched at cosmetics, it wasn't really being done. And I had a lot of retailers say people will not buy makeup from images that look like them. Like they need like like for for uh, and they would explain this to me in detail. They would say things to me like um, you need to have an unattainable image of beauty that someone can never hope to achieve for them to buy your product. And I'm like okay, or maybe people are sick and tired of seeing people that don't look like them. You know, because for me, I have rosacea, bright red, bumpy everywhere on my cheeks and my nose and my forehead. And I couldn't find makeup that worked for me, right? My whole company started with a problem I didn't know how to solve. And, and I realized, oh, I've never seen any models, but, you know, selling makeup that look like me that have skin challenges. And and then I would try all the products and they wouldn't work. And so I just kind of like had this gut feeling, well, you know, if I, you know, am this age or size or skin tone or I have the skin challenge or whatever it is, and I don't see someone who is showing me the product works for them, how do I know it works for me? It was just intuitive to me, but it, it wasn't being done. And they all told me, like, if you, literally, if you want to get in our stores, you know, here's what you need to do. And those are the moments, Nicole, that define our lives when our gut tells us one thing, but like in my case, I had no money. I was, you know, if we were going to like for three years, I didn't know how we were going to stay in business. Right. And, and I made the decision to listen to my gut and to not change what it was telling me about what to do with our brand. Uh, and that is, I believe like critical to ever building anything that lasts or anything that matters. When you change who you are authentically, and I'm I, even when it comes to your product or your positioning or you know your vision, when you start changing that because you want to get into a store or or get onto someone's site who's huge or you know whatever it is, um, it's a short term pop in in revenue, and it feels good for a minute, but long term, I think I think. Um, I think it's one of the biggest reasons why tens of thousands of founders don't make it because they start getting distracted by what everyone else tells them is right for their brand or is hot or is going to make them money. Uh, and they dilute their own authentic secret sauce. And at the end of the day, you can't fake authenticity and customers are smart and they know it. And over time, it never works when you, when you go against what you authentically know for your brand. And you listened to your gut, you went with accessible versus aspirational, but how did you actually make a product? Like, what did you know about fulfillment and packaging and chemists and QA process and graphics and all that stuff? You were starting yeah. in your living room, you did all the jobs, like, yeah, get yeah. it, girl. <laughs> Thank you. I, lo I love that. Yeah. And, and also like my whole goal was that like, I, by the way, I, I authentically, authentically believe that accessible is aspirational. Like I authentically in every ounce of my being believe every person's beautiful. You know what I mean? And so for me, it was like this big thing of how do we shift perspective around that? Um, uh, when I grew up and I would see beauty ads, I love them, but I, they also made me 
like doubt I was enough, right? I loved these commercials I saw and I always wanted to look like them. And, you know, uh, but but what I realized is that, you know, if, if we could shift perspective to this idea that I believe that every person's beautiful, like you can help, first of all, heal a lot of people, but also uh, from, from a lot of not enoughness, but also, you know, my whole hope with it cosmetics was to put out images, uh, you know, for every little kid who's about to see these beauty ads and start doubting themselves and, and every grown person who still does. So it was this big monster ambition for a company that for years, as you mentioned, started in our living room, wasn't selling anything, uh, didn't know how I was going to make it. Um, and I had to figure out how to do almost every job um, because, you know, in the beginning, um, we poured all of our money into R&D, into making a product. And, um, and then I had no money to hire anybody. And then all of a sudden we weren't selling anything. And so one thing I think is important to talk about, it's a, it's a big reason why I wrote about a lot of this in, in um, Believe It, that I, my new book that I just launched, because I feel like when you today in 2021, when you see social media and you see people's websites, it looks, it, you don't see this part of it. And and when you're when you're a founder and you're sitting there going, I can't afford to hire more people, and I don't like you. Sometimes you feel alone in your own struggles, or, or like you're the only one, or like you're failing, or like you're not going to make it. And you know, I think that sharing these stories behind the stories is really important. So yeah, I mean, we were in our living room, and you know. Uh, couldn't afford to hire people. So <laughs> my husband bought, this is so old school, but he bought this um, because, because you have to figure out how to do every job the best, you know, how that's kind of the only option, right? So he bought this um, HTML for dummies, built our first website. Uh, and I'll never forget because all the stores were telling us, no, I'm like, okay, we're going to go direct, direct to consumer. Like this product is so good. I believe in it. And the first day our website launched, um, I was like, this is going to be huge. And I was, uh, I felt like a little kid on Christmas morning, you know, just freaking out and, and I'll never forget. Um, it went live and the first day we had no sales and the second day, no orders, third day, no orders. And we were a few weeks in, I finally said to him, anyone who works with like a friend or a family member, they'll know this. But I, I said to him, I'm like, it's broken. You did it wrong. Like, there's no way, like this product is so good. There's no way we're getting no orders. Um, anyways, uh, several weeks in, we finally got our very first order for It Cosmetics and we're in our living room and I was like screaming, running around. I was so excited. And then he says to me, he goes, that was me. He goes, I placed that order to prove to you the website's not broken. I didn't build it wrong. And so it was really tough. And, you know, it was like every job we kind of had to figure out, right? And uh, you and I were kind of laughing about this before the start of, um, of the event today, but, uh, you know, I couldn't afford to hire anyone. So like, my name's Jamie Marie Kern Lima. And, you know, so Jamie, so I had the CEO role of the company, uh, but, uh, but so then I had my middle name as Marie. She got her own email address and Marie started uh, heading customer service and heading PR. And so Marie at, at cosmetics.com would like email Good Morning America and email all the shows and be like, great news, our founder, Jamie's available for an interview and great news with this big product launch. And anyways, it was just like, so scrappy and, um, you know, and, and, and really, really unglamorous. Um, and the one thing I think is a little different and getting harder right now that I'll say for founders is with a social media, um, digital driven world right now, it's so tempting to spend money on things that look really good online, but don't actually serve your customers. Um, and, and, and prioritizing flat. I see so many entrepreneurs like right now prioritizing, cause I know their businesses, cause I, I've invested in over, <laughs> I, and I own over parts of over 15 companies and I invest in so many female founder brands. And the, the biggest temptation I see is spending money on things that I don't want to just say feed our ego, but make us feel legit <laughs> as a company. Right. And I see so many people prioritizing flash over cash and that is a huge mistake and it's so easy to do. And in my journey, I mean, I've now had the blessing of meeting tens of thousands of entrepreneurs and, you know, 
most of them don't make it. And I see a lot of them and the way that they even spend their money as a business. Um, and I'm talking, Nicole, to you about like, like down to the nitty gritty things. Like we'll, we would be at QVC and their rent, they would rent a nice car. And I'm like thinking, and you know, when you're an entrepreneur and you're scrappy, every penny matters. And I'm like, oh, I mean, now we have Uber, which is great, but I'm like, oh, it's like, a co I'm going economy, bottom of the, like every penny needs to go into your business, not into the things that are, um, you know, in, in the journey. And so I think, but, but with social media, I think it's a really big thing uh, now that impacts a lot of people um, as they start spending their money the wrong way, um, just so everything looks good online. And these jobs are not that hard, I suppose. Uh, you figured it out by being a PR person. You learned all this stuff in addition to having jewel tone clothing um, from local news times and getting a lot of press. You did get a lot of press for yourself. And you also learned uh, about contouring super early on, which I love. Uh, but it sounds like sometimes you can be too early in big trends. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I um, it's, a, it's such a funny story, and I, a lot of people probably rem remember the big contouring boom that started with the palettes and uh, some celebrities getting into it. And you know, I had um, my weight always fluctuated, and and I was always getting in trouble for gaining weight back in the days when I was a, a news anchor. And I learned to contour so good. <laughs> I learned to contour, and so yeah, we launched contouring palettes for face and body. It was some of our first products. And they didn't sell, like literally didn't sell. And they were so innovative. I'm so proud of them. Didn't sell at all. And uh, uh, a couple of years later, um, some of the much bigger brands at the time um, actually knocked off our products exactly, like the exact colors, the exact palette, the exact design. Uh, and they had huge market share and they hit at the right time. So yeah, sometimes timing, uh, you know, just being first isn't always isn't always optimal. Um, I think it's UFC fighter Conor McGregor, and I do not watch UFC, but he has a quote that I talk about in my book um, where he says, uh, precision beats power and timing beats speed. And it's a really good quote. And it's, it's really, um, you know, I talk a lot in, in Believe It in the book about you know, how I built a billion dollar company from nothing. And this idea of precision beats power, right? Because the beauty industry, like so many industries, is an industry of giants. And 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 to enter it <laughs> and to and to kind of like pass all of them uh, takes a really different focus. Um, and I think it's not always about being the biggest company. It's not always being about the first to market. I think it's about really doing it authentically and not wavering with your secret sauce and, and learning how to trust your gut uh, over, over anyone else's advice. And I know we're almost out of time. I could talk to you forever, but um, just really quickly, I know that timing is so important and this is something that comes up a lot in Founder Made about taking outside money. Um, you're really close to taking an outside investment. Um, can you tell us that story and why you're happy you didn't? <laughs> yeah, our journey with with uh, investors was was wild. We were a few years into the business. I didn't know how we were going to make it. We got down to under a thousand dollars in our bank account, personal and and company combined. Um, and we got an inbound interest from a huge private equity company, and I was so excited, Nicole. I thought like, oh my gosh, this is going to be life changing. If you know, because this was a private equity firm that was really well known for investing in unknown companies and making them household names and consumer products. And um, so we started doing meetings with them and they, they loved our product. And uh, we got to the, we, you know, we did the diligence phase and, and several meetings. I'll cut the story short. I talk more about it and believe it in the book, but we got to um, the, the final meeting and uh, the head guy. So we flew up in person for it. And the head investor um, said, you know, congratulations. We really, really believe in your product. Um, and he was in person about three feet from me. And he says, uh, but it's a no, we're going to pass on investing in it cosmetics. And I was like devastated because I thought, oh my gosh, I don't want to go bankrupt. And maybe he could, you know, if they said yes, maybe they could help get us in all these stores. Um, and he said, it, it's a no, we're, we're going to pass. And I said, can you tell me why? Because, um, you know, feedback is a gift usually. Um, and I'll never forget, he was three feet from me. And he says, do you want me to be really honest with you? And I was like, yes, please. 
And he says, uh, I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your body and your weight. And I remember in this moment, like the, the words, kind of remember, I remember his mouth moving. I remember feeling his breath actually, but I remember him saying, I, I just don't think we're gonna buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your, your body and your weight. And first of all, a lifetime of body doubt, self-doubt like flooded my body. I mean, I, later I went in my car and cried, but in that moment, I'll never forget this. When he was saying those words to me, like I got this feeling in my gut, deep in my gut that said he's wrong. Like I felt it, right? And the next several years, I wouldn't have, I didn't talk to him. I didn't see him or, or, or uh, interact with him again for six years, but over the next six years. And I think, first of all, all of us go through experiences like this in life where someone literally looks us in the eye and tells us we're not enough or, or change who we are to make it. And, you know, over the next six years, there were so many times where his words would come in my head. I would literally have to imagine myself turning down the volume on him, right? Like I was, I was talking about earlier and that feeling I had, that gut feeling that said he's wrong, I would turn the volume up on that in my own mind. I would give that space in my own mind and I would trust it. I would trust that he was wrong. And, you know, on the journey, there were a lot of other people that were amazing. And we did take on private equity a few years later. Uh, and that was an amazing experience, like amazing experience um, with TSG, who uh, TSG Consumer Partners, they're like great friends now in our personal life, you know? I mean, it was such a good experience, but, but six years later, um, uh, just to wrap this up, when, when the day we sold to L'Oreal, so L'Oreal bought it cosmetics and made the decision because they're a public company to announce the purchase price. So it was all over the press that day and the homepage of the Wall Street Journal. And it was like, it cosmetics sells for $1.2 billion cash. And I heard from that investor. Um, and I hadn't heard from him in six years. And he said, uh, congratulations on the L'Oreal deal. I was wrong. Um, and I would have learned, by the way, it would have been the most successful investment uh, in his firm's history. Um, but, but just to end on this note, I, I talk about this idea in the book that I think, you know, and this is no matter what faith someone has, but there's a famous saying that rejection is God's protection. Or some people say rejection is the universe's protection. And it's like, I wanted him to invest so bad at the time, but had he said yes, I was so desperate, Nicole. I was, I didn't know how we we're going to stay in business. I probably would have given him the majority of the company for almost no money. And so because he said no, by the time we sold for $1.2 billion cash, we were still the largest shareholders. Um, and I was like, thank God he didn't believe in me. <laughs> like, thank God he rejected me. And I didn't change who I was. I didn't try to go, oh, I need to get all skinny to sell. I would tell my things like, you know, tell myself things like, well, you know, if Oprah had changed her weight, would she have had been more successful? No, right? Like I start looking into all my, my mentors and, and icons and I'm like, no, you can't change who you are authentically. So yeah, investing has been a, um, a really wild ride and you, you encounter so many forms of rejection in it. I'm glad we did it in the long run, um, but it was quite a journey. <laughs> quite a journey indeed. It's such a great story. I like my blood is boiling thinking about that man. I <laughs> just want to punch him in the face, um, but he did apologize. So I hate him just a little bit less, but I love the fact that you were laughing all the way to the bank <laughs> because you believed it. You're such an it girl. And this is such a great way to start the day. Several shots of espresso in all of our motivation lattes yes. this morning. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for having me too. It's such an honor and founders are my people. So I'm honored to be here with everyone and just excited to cheer everyone on in their journeys too. Ladies, Jamie. thank you so much. Jamie, your story was an absolute inspiration. As Nicole said, my blood was boiling and my heart is still pounding just having heard every part of that. So thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you for leading us through such a great session. That was so huge. Uh, you know, as a member of the Founder Made leadership team, having been in the trenches of building Founder Made from the ground up, everything that session stands for so resonates. But one key takeaway for me was faith over fear. But, and I wrote this down, faith over fear by connecting with your intuition and fighting the urge to listen to everyone else versus killing the energy and vision that makes your brand authentic is so, so important. I love that. I mean, there's so many key takeaways and, and nuggets, uh, but thank you again. 